my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar and i am happy to share with you all that today is our 68th international physics webinar so a very a good day to all and i hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic so all we know that uh, we are staying in a, a corona pandemic situation so all the institution have been shut down uh, due to corona pandemic since march 2020 so we cannot continue our normal academic program inside the campus so we have to start our online program to continue our academic program so our department uh, department of physics patna university of science and technology has started its online program including online classes and online inter international physics webinar and we have successfully completed our 67th international physics webinar and today it's our 68th today it's very important day for our department and today i'd like to welcome you all to a joint session between Department of Physics, Patna University of Science and Technology, and the Department of Physics and Astrophysics, University of Delhi, Delhi, India, in astrophysics. And we have with us here today, Dr. Uh, Patrick uh, uh, Dashgupta sir, professor. He's currently working at the Professor Department of Physics and Astrophysics at the University of Delhi, uh, India, and he has already connected with us. So I'd like to welcome our speaker, sir. Uh, welcome to our. international physics webinar and welcome to our university through online sir thank you thank you very much dr das and uh, we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the department of physics patna university of science and technology sir we are very grateful to you to that that you accepted our invitation sir in this uh, corona pandemic situation we know that uh, you are too busy with your uh, research work and uh, your and other works But, but still you uh, accepted our invitation so for our student it was, so, it was my yeah and i'm feeling uh, very happy to host you so for those who are new uh, i'd like to uh, inform that uh, we have divided our webinar into three parts first uh, we'd like to introduce our speaker with all of you uh, and then our uh, speaker will deliver his speech and at the end we, we have a uh, discussion time in that time anybody can join with us So I think you have already come to know the title of our today's uh, international physics webinar. The title is the supermassive black hole and their formation. And uh, uh, our speaker is Dr. Patrick Das uh, uh, Gupta sir, and he is currently working as a professor at the Department of Physics and Astrophysics at the University of Delhi, uh, Delhi, India. And uh, uh, I'd like to welcome our speaker again, sir. Uh, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. It's your time, sir. You can start your session, sir. thank you thank you very much all right so uh, it's a great day for me too because uh, i am for the first time giving a, giving a talk for my uh, friends and students uh, at bangladesh i have a deep connection with bangladesh their literature particularly as i was talking to professor pritam das about the poems of kazi nazrul islam and in particular um, i am also uh, in a sense uh, pitching this talk as a tribute to two uh, very talented physicists who were connected with bangladesh one is professor satyendranath bose who did his uh, work on the bosonic statistics while he was associated with the university of dhaka the other is professor jamal n islam who is a very well known cosmologist of bangladesh in fact um, uh, he also has done work on primordial black holes uh, with uh, professor bernard schultz but of course today's talk is about much uh, more massive black holes and uh, these black holes are found in the centers of galaxy and no one knows for sure how this mammoth and huge supermassive black holes are formed when the universe was very young but as a preamble uh, let me mention that the whole idea of choosing this topic is connected with the recent nobel prize Uh, in physics that was awarded to roger penrose uh, and the other half being shared by reinhard genzel and andrea gaze for their pioneering work on 
black holes and the singularity. In particular, Ro Roger Penrose in 1965 showed that Einstein's general relativity, when you consider gravitational collapse in Einstein's general relativity, then under very general condition, singularities uh, have to form. While Reinhardt and Andrea, by painstaking observations of stellar motion around the galactic center, the so-called Sagittarius A star, they conclusively proved that there is a very massive object, almost 4.5 million times heavier than our nearest star, namely the sun. We will talk about it in some detail later on. And uh, no object with such huge mass and occupying such a compact volume uh, can exist other than it being a supermassive black hole. We will discuss more about it later. And of course, uh, Penrose and later on Stephen Hawking, they proved some powerful theorems regarding formation of space-time singularities. And uh, unfortunately, Stephen Hawking passed away a um, few years back. And um, I'm sure if he was alive, then both uh, Penrose and Hawking would have been awarded Nobel Prize on black hole singularities. At the same time, we must also pay tribute to uh, two other general relativists. One is Subramaniam Chandrasekhar, whose work showed that black hole solution is not just a mathematical solution, but stars, when they lose the energy production due to thermonuclear fusion, the natural consequence of very massive stars necessarily have to be in the form of uh, black holes. And then uh, in 1955, Professor, late Professor Amol Kumar Raichodhuri, uh, who later on became a very uh, uh, famous and loved teacher in the Presidency College, Professor Amol Kumar Raichodhuri in 1955, when he was considering the singularity in the cosmology, he uh, obtained an equation from Einstein's general relativity which is known internationally as Raichodhri equation. And Raichodhri equation uh, showed uh, conclusively that when there is no rotation, then uh, there has to be a past singularity. And using Raichodhri equation, Penrose and Hawking later on proved some powerful theorems. Right. And we also know that uh, even in Newtonian physics, one could obtain a black hole-like solution. And I'll place before you the argument originally put forward by the British uh, bishop as well as physicist Michel and uh, uh, the French mathematician and physicist Laplace independently, uh, showing that even Newtonian physics can lead to a concept of a very dark star. The idea is very simple. Imagine that you have a spherical body having mass capital M and radius capital R. And you ask, what should be the minimum speed with which you should throw a test body from the surface of this spherical massive object so that the test body barely escapes to infinity. And we all know from school days, we calculate uh, the escape velocity. And the idea is very simple. If it has to escape to infinity barely, then at infinity, if it is barely escaping to infinity, its speed must be zero. And because it is at infinity, its gravitational potential energy has to be also zero. 
so that at infinity if it is barely escaping then its total energy is zero and since energy is conserved from the surface if we throw with a speed v then at the surface the kinetic energy is half mv square and the gravitational potential energy is minus g capital m small m divided by capital r where small m is the mass of the test body that is being thrown outwards conservation of energy demands that initial total energy kinetic energy plus potential energy must be zero in order this object barely escapes to infinity and from this equation we get the result that the escape speed must be square root of 2 gm divided by r okay and in particular if you substitute the mass of earth for capital m and about 6000 km for the radius of earth and you evaluate square root of g to gm by r you will find that the value is 11.2 km per second so that is the escape speed uh, corresponding to earth if you want to throw a cricket ball which escapes the earth's gravitational field then you have to throw it with a speed minimum speed of 11.2 km per second now what michel and independently laplace argued is that suppose you have such a star and the star starts shrinking that means r capital r which is the radius of the spherical star it keeps decreasing with time then they argued that when the star's radius becomes 2 gm by c square then only light can escape that is very simple if for capital r you substitute rs which is 2 gm by c square then you can easily see 2 gm 2 gm will cancel and the escape speed becomes the speed of light so therefore the object that is shrinking as soon as the size of the object reaches the size 2 gm by c square it becomes dark because even light will take light will find it difficult to escape and in particular if the size becomes less than 2 gm by c square then the escape speed becomes greater than the speed of light but we all know from special theory of relativity that nothing can move faster than speed of light and hence if the gravitating object its size becomes less than 2 gm by c square then no particle including light can escape the surface of the star and therefore the object becomes a black hole in other words newtonian gravity also tells us that you will have a black hole if the size of the massive object goes below this 2 gm by c square and it is also very amazing that even in general relativity when you take a spherical symmetric mass distribution and obtain the exact general relativistic solution outside the spherical distribution you also find that there is this characteristic gravitational radius 2 gm by c square where funny things start happening in fact few months after albert einstein gave his theory of general relativity as you know general relativity is a theory of gravitation that is consistent with special theory of relativity after few months of publishing the paper on general relativity carl schwarzschild he studied the paper and gave the first exact solution uh, corresponding to the geometry of the space time around a spherically symmetric object of mass m and he showed that there is a peculiarity that if the mass distribution size goes below this 2 gm by c square 
then all kinds of funny things start happening and i will in a brief while i will mention what that uh, strange thing uh, is but the fact means that schwarzschild solution also gives you the same gravitational uh, radius to gm by c square that emerges from michel and laplace kind of argument uh, now note that the gravitational radius for spherically symmetric distribution uh, as a respect to carl schwarzschild we call to gm by c square as the schwarzschild radius and what is the peculiar property of this mathematical surface called at a radius of schwarzschild radius peculiarity is that any event that happens below this mathematical surface we can't know about such an event because light can't escape out to an observer who is standing outside the event horizon and hence this mathematical surface radius to gm by c square is called the event horizon okay since the schwarzschild radius is linearly uh, dependent on the mass of the object therefore you can compute what would be the schwarzschild radius if i were to make sun into a black hole that means if i take our nearest star the sun compress it below to gm by c square where m is mass of the sun which is 2 times 10 to the power 33 gram then sun will also collapse into a black hole and the corresponding size of the event horizon if you put m to be 2 into 10 to the power 33 gram the schwarzschild radius will be 3 kilometers in other words since schwarzschild radius is linearly related to the mass of the object you can compute very easily the schwarzschild radius of any black hole of mass m which will be just 3 kilometers multiplied by mass of the object divided by mass of sun so it's a very simple thing so you take any object if you are interested in calculating the size of the event horizon then it will be 3 kilometers multiplied by mass of the object divided by mass of the sun so this relation and in particular since the matter once it goes below the event horizon it necessarily has to collapse gravitationally into a single point that point entire mass gets clustered at that point so density becomes infinite and since einstein's general relativity says that the gravity is nothing but the non euclidean geometry of the space time even the geometrical curvature at this point becomes infinity just like density becomes infinity such infinities are called singularities for completeness i will flash you the solution the exact solution that carl schwarzschild obtained so if you choose a spherical polar coordinate system and ask that if you have a spherically symmetric distribution of a matter with total mass m then outside the matter what is the geometry of the space time that that means if you take two events one at coordinate r theta phi and time t and another nearby event whose coordinate is r plus dr theta plus d theta phi plus d phi and t plus dt then the four dimensional invariant distance between the two events is given by this schwarzschild line element okay and you can see the funny thing that i was talking about the moment r that means the radial distance from r equal to 
once it becomes equal to the Schwarzschild radius, 2gm by c square, this quantity in the bracket becomes zero. That means zero, zero component of the metric becomes zero, while RR component of the metric becomes minus infinity. Or if R becomes less than um, 2gm by c square, it becomes a large positive quantity. And such things uh, show that something is funny going around. Uh, and that is what Carl Schwarzschild pointed out. But Carl Schwarzschild thought that no star can ever have such a small radius 2gm by c squared. So he and rest of the uh, community, physics community, thought that it's just a mathematical peculiarity. In real world, no star can have such a small size. Till S. Chandrasekhar, when he was working uh, with the evolution of white dwarfs, he demonstrated that the relativistic degenerate electron gas can not be supported against gravity if the mass of the white dwarf becomes greater than 1.4 times the sun's mass. Necessarily, therefore, the object has to collapse. And then neutron stars were discovered and we know that if the neutron star masses are more than 2.5 to 3 times sun's mass, even they cannot be protected against gravitational collapse. So in other words, the work of Chandrasekhar and later work with neutron stars showed that black holes are real possibility in our cosmos. Right. So there is another kind of black hole. Uh, the exact solution was obtained by Roy Patrick Kerr in 1963. Uh, these are the rotating black holes. And rotating black holes, uh, they are even stranger. Not only there is an event horizon covering all around the space-time singularity where the density as well as geometric curvature, they all become infinity. But apart from the event horizon, there is a region, the light gray shadow region outside the event horizon uh, where no particle can remain at rest, no matter how powerful rockets they have. They Once they enter the, the so-called ergosphere, they necessarily have to move with respect to observers at very large distances. And then Penrose showed that in the ergosphere region, there are negative energy trajectories. That means what? That means uh, if you take some particles moving in the opposite direction uh, of the rotation of the black hole, then it is possible for those particles to have total energy negative, total energy meaning rest mass energy, plus kinetic energy, plus gravitational potential energy. So entire energy can be negative with respect to observers far away from the so-called Kerr black holes. And there is a very interesting uh, possibility Penrose outlined called Penrose process by which you can send in a particle from outside which will of course have positive energy. And once it reaches the event horizon, it breaks up into two particles. One particle enters the negative energy trajectory. The other particle necessarily therefore has to come out with greater the energy than the initial energy because of the conservation of energy. Right, Penrose of course in 1965 used uh, two new ideas uh, for the first time. One is he characterized the space-time singularity at r equal to zero as an incomplete geodesic. That is, if a particle falls, if there is a singularity, then the particle falls, hits the singularity, and they, that's it. Its trajectory abruptly ends there. If there are no singularities, then the particle's trajectory will be infinitely long. It can go anywhere. But if there's a singularity, then the trajectory as soon as it hits the singularity, it gets 
truncated. So incomplete geodesics are the hallmark of space-time singularities. The other thing which he introduced is the so-called null surfaces. Null surfaces are closed null surfaces. The idea is that if you have a closed two-dimensional surface, then if you send inwards a light beam and outwards a light beam, then it is a closed trapped null surfaces if the distance between the two light beams, that means inward going light beam, outer going light beam, instead of increasing, decreases. Such a thing is called closed trapped null surfaces. And using these two ideas, uh, Penrose proved the existence of singularity whenever the gravitational collapse happens with matter satisfying the weak energy condition, namely the energy density plus three times pressure is positive. Okay, okay now we go towards uh, cosmology and uh, uh, in the field of cosmology, uh, Professor Jain Islam had uh, done a lot of work. In particular, he has a very interesting paper on the ultimate fate of the universe. Uh, so those who are interested, they can uh, read about uh, the ultimate fate of the universe. In fact, Professor Freeman J. Dyson, who passed away in February this year, he that paper of Jain Islam influenced him uh, so much that Dyson himself wrote a long paper in the reviews of modern physics outlining his ideas concerning remote future. Uh, you may also read Dyson's paper. Now, our universe uh, is teeming with galaxies. You can see elliptical galaxies. You can also see spiral galaxies. And by now, so these are spiral galaxies. By now, we know that all these spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies at their center, they have supermassive black holes. What do I mean by saying supermassive black holes? Black holes whose mass is larger than million times sun's mass are called supermassive black holes. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. Now, uh, by now, astronomers have observed more than 10 million galaxies. And uh, we know that the distance between galaxies are increasing with time. And that's why uh, we believe that our universe is described by a Big Bang model where the universe is expanding. And the universe was created from a singular point. Singularity as far as classical general relativity is concerned. Yes, if you physicists think that if quantum gravity theories are applied, then singularities where things become infinite will be cured. But we still don't know uh, which is the correct quantum theory of gravity. So from classical general of classical general theory of relativity, we know that the universe was created from an infinite density, infinite temperature state about 13.8 billion years ago. And universe since then, from the point of singularity, universe has been expanding. By expanding, I mean, it's not that the galaxies are moving, rather the distance between galaxies are increasing with time because general relativity is a geometrical theory uh, of the space-time. So in other words, uh, what one means is that if you imagine that you're baking a loaf of bread and there are these nuts and raisins, then the galaxies are like nuts and raisins and when you are baking your bread, when you put the uh, bread in the oven, the, the flour, the wheat flour, they expand. 
So the bread expands with the raisins don't, the nuts and the raisins don't. Galaxies are not expanding, but the distance between the galaxies are expanding. And that is what gives rise to various expanding universe model depending upon the density. If the density is greater than critical density, it will expand, then collapse later on. And these are the things which have been uh, talked about by uh, the papers by Professor Jain Islam, Professor Dyson. And they could be if the density is smaller, it could keep on expanding. And today, uh, the our idea is that not only the universe expanding, but there is some dark energy which is making the universe expand at an accelerated pace because of the repulsive gravity coming out of the dark energy. So this is just a summary of what is happening. The universe was created from a point of singularity around 13.8 billion years ago and it started expanding and there was a phase when it expanded in an exponential fashion called the inflationary expansion. Then as later on, of course, inflation end ended and it started expanding as a power law fashion. And when it cooled below a temperature of few thousand degree Kelvin, neutral hydrogen atoms formed. Neutral hydrogen atoms along with dark matter gave rise to galaxies. And then around stars, planets formed complex amino acids and nucleo, um, uh, nucleic acids formed out of which life got created. Finally, thinking human got created. Same thinking human whose brain is made out of atoms, molecules, now is trying to find out the laws uh, that govern the atoms, quarks, fundamental particles, including the quantum gravity. This is one of the very mysterious aspect of how knowledge is obtained through the action of thinking, while thinking itself is activity of a brain that is made out of quarks, electrons, and so on. It's a highly philosophically mysterious problem. Right, as I said, there are all kinds of galaxies, and in particular, you have galaxies called spiral galaxies, as you can see in this picture. Spiral galaxies are galaxies with a big bulge, and at the center, there'll be a supermassive black hole, and outwards the disk, you have magnificent spiral arms. All right, and then there are much bigger galaxies called elliptical galaxies. They are spheroidal galaxies. And in particular, this particular elliptical galaxy is called the M87. It's an elliptical galaxy called M87, the 87th object in the Messier's catalog. And you can see this jet coming out. And the jet-like activity is because of the processes around a supermassive black hole, which weighs 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. And recently, Event Horizon Telescope mapped the region just above the event horizon of this supermassive black hole at the heart of the elliptical galaxy M87. Then there are other kinds of elliptical galaxies. and Astrophysicists, they largely there is a consensus that these huge elliptical galaxies are formed by the collisions of spiral galaxies. As you can see here, two spiral galaxies, they have come so close to each other that the tidal forces are pulling out the and causing tails and bridges of gaseous uh, matter of these spiral galaxies. And slowly, the dynamical friction, which was predicted by Chandrasekhar, that makes all the matter spiral in and form a large, featureless elliptical galaxy. And this is a um, view of the how galaxies evolve with time. So this is a present era. If you look at the galaxies in the past, 
then you find in the past most of the galaxies were spiral galaxies and the size of the spiral galaxies were also smaller and this nicely fits into uh, the scenario which i mentioned that as time evolved forward these spiral galaxies they accreted more gas became bigger spiral galaxies and then the bigger spiral galaxies they interacted with each other collided and some fraction of spiral galaxies when they interacted collided gave rise to elliptical galaxies okay. let's me skip this slide so there's another short view of the expanding model so here the singular region and it started expanding and as it expanded uh, so this is not sorry i'm not so i'm going backwards this is the present day singular region is here the big bang uh, singularity is here and something happened from singularity hot matter came out and it started cooling because of the expansion and the first stars were formed when the present size uh, the 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 present size of the universe divided by the size of the universe when the first stars were formed was around 19 or 20 and here we are where uh, the uh, present size to present size is 1 and therefore the redshift which is the size present size divided by the si size of the universe minus 1 so the present day is redshift 0 and the farthest galaxy that has been spotted is at a redshift 11.1 redshift of 11.1 meaning that the light that was emitted from this galaxy the farthest galaxy uh, we see to reach us the universe size of the universe was so small that is the present size of the universe divided by the size of the universe during that time was 12 that's why red shift is 11.1 and the clear the as i said that all dominant galaxies like spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies they house supermassive black holes at the center in particular our solar system is in a galaxy called milky way galaxy this is an artist's conception based on distribution of stars of the shape of our milky way galaxy if we look from the top as you can see the magnificent spiral arms of our milky way galaxy and our solar system is here which is about 24 thousand light years from the center of the galaxy the center of the galaxy is towards the sagittarius constellation that means we look towards the sagittarius constellation but we have to go beyond and if we peer at it then we find the center of the galaxy and in this picture the exact center of the galaxy is marked as this star the star is the center of our galaxy and andrea base and reinhard genzel independently they monitored the motion of the stars around the galactic center from about 1995 to 2004 and beyond they are still monitoring the stars and they found to their dismay that many stars they go very close to the center and then the turn around just like when we study the kepler problem in our classical mechanics then we show that because of the gravitational potential being proportional to minus 1 divided by r there are circular orbit elliptical orbits and so on and what andrea and reinhardt they discovered was that this highly eccentric orbit whose focus is the galactic center they can estimate by monitoring 
the stellar motion, the amount of mass which is concentrated in this point. For example, if you have a circular orbit around the galactic center, then the rule that centripetal force must be provided by the gravitational force gives you the equation that V square must be equal to gm by r. Okay, So V square equal to gm by r immediately enables me to measure the mass at the center because the velocity of the star's motion can be monitored by looking at the position of the stars at different times. And how close does it go to the center gives me my radial distance r. And for circular orbit, since I know v square by r must be equal to gm by r square, hence v is square root of gm by r, v is measurable, r is measurable, and hence mass can be estimated. And Andrea and Reinhardt uh, looked at some of the very close by star going around the center. In fact, they saw that the star went as close to 120 times the Earth-Sun distance. The Earth-Sun distance is called one astronomical unit. And the orbit of the star, S2, it went as close as 120 times Earth-Sun distance, which is about 10 to the power 11 meters. 10 to the power 11 meters is a Look at the size, 10 to the 11 meters multiplied by 120. That means around 10 to the 13 meters. While from the trajectory, the mass they estimated was more than 4 million solar mass. Huge amount of mass and the size over which the mass is spread is less than, has to be less than 120 times Earth's sun distance. Only object that can be so compact with such huge mass is a supermassive black hole. Okay? And their work therefore showed that the, our galactic center, this is our galactic center, that center has a very compact object whose mass is 4.5 million times heavier than sun. And if you peer at the center using Chandra uh, X-ray telescope, you find X-ray emission, uh, bright X-ray emission. And of course, the bright X-ray emission will not let you see the uh, black hole. Um, but the stellar motion tells us that the black hole is indeed present, having, has, having a mass 4.5 billion times the mass of the sun. There are other kinds of galaxies like quasars. So here is a picture of quasar 3C175. That means uh, in the third Cambridge catalog, the 175 uh, source is a quasar. That means if you look at this object in optical, it appears like a star. But if you look at it in radio, using a radio telescope, you find that there is a radio jet coming out, ending with a radio lobe. At the opposite side also, there is a radio lobe. And such objects are called active galactic nuclei. Meaning what? That what we see as a star-like point is actually the nuclear region of a galaxy. So truly speaking, there is a galaxy. But because the central source outshines the galaxy. It is emitting from a compact region radiation, which are thousand, more than thousand times the total emission from the galaxy. And for a long time, people did not understand how can such huge energy come from such compact region till many astrophysicists starting from Hoyle, Linden Bell, Martin Rees, uh, Saul Peter, they realize that it is due to matter swirling around supermassive black holes. So this is another active galactic nuclei. It's also a radio galaxy, an elliptical 
radio galaxy and if you see in radio this is the optical red uh, elliptical galaxy if you look at it in radio uh, emission you find there are jets coming out and hubble space telescope looks at the central region in optical and they find a region very compact region and you see dust and there's a bright part the bright part is believed to be the accretion disk around a supermassive black hole and this supermassive black hole at the center of ngc 42c1 galaxy has a mass more than 500 million times the sun's mass and this is the a close up view of the m87 elliptical galaxy and you can see from the central region a jet that is visible this jet is visible not only in optical it is visible in x rays in radio and so on so therefore uh, these active galaxy nuclei must have a supermassive black hole around which matter is going around and uh, so therefore the current model of active galactic nuclei is that there is a black hole matter is going around in a disk like shape and because of the going around of the matter the magnetic field lines also get wrapped up in a helical manner so all the high energy charged particles because of the lorentz force confinement they move out in the form of jet but all this require a supermassive black hole at the center and people have modeled the active galactic nuclei and indeed they find from using numerical uh, studies of magnetohydrodynamics indeed you see the jets coming out due to fast moving hot plasma around a supermassive black hole so in other words supermassive black holes are very much required to produce this intense energy from the accretion disk which shines like a quasar star but the jets confined by the magnetic field they appear in radio most of the time but you require a black hole with an event horizon so that matter can come very close to the event horizon become very hot and the mag magnetic field lines also get twisted or around by now several active galactic nuclei and quasars have been seen and in this plot in the y axis one has plotted the luminosity of the central object of which is shining as a quasar in units of sun's luminosity solar luminosity its value is 4 times 10 to the power 33 ergs per second very large energy per second 4 into 10 to the power 33 ergs per second and here are the quasars you can see how luminous the quasars are the brightest quasar so far observed is a quasar called sdss j0100 plus 2802 you can see its luminosity is more than 10 to the power 14 times 4 into 10 to the power 33 ergs per second huge energy and its black hole mass estimated is 12 billion times heavier than the mass of the sun at the same time from its redshift its redshift redshift is very large 6.3 that means the universe all right was more than five times smaller than the present size when the light left the quasar to reach us that means the universe was about 0.9 billion years old when the light left this quasar to reach us so therefore in the x axis you can see for different quasars the supermassive black hole required to explain the quasar activity the question then arises that how do you form such huge black holes 12 billion times heavier 
than sun when the universe was only 0.9 billion years old. Remember, today the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So therefore, there must be method to form such massive black holes in short time scales. Here is another large elliptical galaxy in a cluster of galaxies. And in this large elliptical galaxy called Homburg 15A, there is a supermassive black hole whose mass is 40 billion times the mass of the sun. 40 billion times the mass of the sun. Huge black hole. How do you form such massive black hole? This is one of the questions that many physicists are trying to answer. And no one knows what is the true reason. And in particular, if you plot the mass of the supermassive black hole at the center against the bulge, meaning the, there is a over density of stars in the form of bulge around the black hole, there is a correlation between the central bulge and the black, black hole mass. That means more is the mass of the supermassive black hole, bigger is the central bulge. These are the questions which have to be answered. Furthermore, people have observed two galaxies by now where there are binary black holes. That means in the central region, you have two supermassive black holes going around each other. So there is a galaxy, radio galaxy 0402 plus 379, which is about 750 million light years away. And you see two supermassive black holes, total mass being 15 billion times sun's mass. And they are going around having an orbital period of 24,000 years. Similarly, another group of people, uh, particularly from NCRA, TIFR uh, in Pune, they have found recently another supermassive uh, black hole pair in a Seifert galaxy. This Seifert galaxy is about 400 million light years away from us. And they find that there is a pair of supermassive black hole whose total mass is about 40 million times heavier than sun. And it is the orbital period of these two supermassive black holes going around each other is uh, about 100,000 years. That means 10 to the power 5 years. So these are the exciting times for such research as to how do you form supermassive black holes? When do you expect to have pairs of such supermassive black holes in a center? Will there be a galaxy uh, which will be discovered later where there are more than two supermassive black holes? These are exciting questions that we need to ask. Okay. So uh, uh, cosmology, the subject is a sub uh, topic in physics which deals with origin of the universe, composition of the universe, and how the uh, universe, universe evolves with time on very large scales. And three of these questions are very fundamental. What makes up the dark matter? What makes up the dark energy that is causing the late time accelerated expansion of the universe? And how are supermassive black holes formed? Uh, I have been also uh, researching on how supermassive black holes are formed. And, uh, uh, but before I come to my work, I will uh, also mention that, uh, uh, that one way to form a supermassive black hole is that if you have a small size black hole, then when stars go past, the tidal force due to the gravity of a black hole can tear apart the star and the torn apart star, the debris of the star can spiral in and fall into the black hole and thereby the black hole mass will increase. But the question is, how 
is the time scale sufficient to produce such gargantuan size supermassive black hole the other idea is apart from tidally disrupted star is fall of dark matter because we know now all galaxies have dark matter around them so people like martin rees abraham loeb and many people have suggested model where the dark matter halo of galaxies can directly collapse to form supermassive black hole so dark matter evidence comes from uh, many uh, work particularly zwicky long time back uh, wood also long time back um, gave the idea of dark matter and then vera rubin's work of rotation velocities of hydrogen clouds far away from galaxies um, showed that the rotation velocities instead of dropping as you go further away they either increase or become flat meaning that apart from the matter that is in the locked up in gases and stars there is also unseen matter dark matter which is providing the centripetal force even at a distance uh, more than 40 light years 40000 light years away and so there is a dark matter and today and similarly zwicky argued that clusters of galaxies they are it is possible to remain gravitationally bound only if there is dark matter so today the consensus view is that a particular galaxy like a spiral galaxy with globular clusters moving around in its halo is surrounded by a large halo of dark matter so if a galaxy has a radius of 40000 or more light years then the dark matter halo has a radius of more than 300000 um light year okay and large dark matter halo and there are many ideas of how uh, black holes can form so here is a paper by voluntary in science 2012 where he discusses ways of forming a uh, black hole but the requirement is the gaseous matter must spherically collapse but then there is a problem that uh, you know if there is a rotation then it is very difficult to uh, make a su sufficient amount of mass collapse to black hole similarly uh, other people who have been working like um uh, professor priyam vada natarajan or professor um, bero and his collaborators they also talk about direct collapse of matter to form huge uh, black holes but they all uh, require um more or less spherical symmetry uh, because if there's a rotation rotation will prohibit a uh, collapse on the other hand uh, we see recently uh, this is called the spider web filaments feeding a supermassive black hole uh, recently they looked at a quasar in the 610 constellation and they find that this quasar uh, is surrounded by six galaxies from which matter is flowing in in a filament manner uh, to feed the black hole the question is why would filamentary formation of gaseous accretion be going on and uh, our work on the other hand um, uh, is about if dark matter is made, made out of very light axions as you know axions were uh, predicted by peche and queen uh, to solve something in qcd called the theta vacuum problem and we in our work um, with uh, my student um, uh, fazlur rahman and uh, eklavya thareja who is doing his phd in usa currently and fazlur rahman who is uh, working in indian institute of astrophysics bangalore doing his phd there uh, when they were project students when they were doing masters they had done a summer school with me and uh, based on that we uh, published these work where we uh, looked at very light bosonic particles like axions and we showed if their mass 
is less than 10 to the power minus 23 electron volts, then they can undergo Bose-Einstein condensation. As you know, Bose, who for a large part of time, um, uh, uh, active uh, part of his research time, he spent in University of Dhaka. Um, uh, he predicted, uh, along with Einstein, that if you cool bosonic system so that the de Broglie wavelength is larger than inter-particle separation, then the entire set of identical boson can be uh, described by a single wave function. In other words, if the temperature is so low that the de Broglie wavelength becomes larger than inter-particle separation, all the bosons occupy the ground state and therefore the ground state can be described by a macroscopic wave function. In fact, the phenomena of superfluidity and superconductivity, they also rely on such macroscopic wave function. And um, what we say is that if the dark matter particles around galaxies are made out of ultralight bosonic particles like axions, then uh, necessarily it will be true that because the universe is cold now, uh, uh, which is about 3 degree Kelvin, the so-called cosmic microwave background temperature, the de Broglie wavelength of these dark matter particles are as long, you can show they are as long as the size of the dark matter halo and therefore they will undergo a Bose-Einstein condensate um, because of this equation, the de Broglie wavelength will be Planck's constant divided by the momentum of these particles. And we find that indeed the wavelength is as long as the uh, size of the uh, dark matter halo. Uh, since my time is up, I will not go into the detail. Um, uh, so we show that we can find out the energy of such a dark matter condensate and they can have rotation also. And in particular, they can collapse. Um, and for a curved black hole, I'll just go to the result because I don't have time. In 10 minutes for eight years time, they can collapse to form a curved black hole. As you know, the event horizon radius of a curved black hole is Schwarzschild radius divided by two plus square root of square of half of the Schwarzschild radius minus angular momentum of the black hole divided by mass into speed of light of the black hole whole square. And once the dark matter condensate, Bose-Einstein condensate, its size becomes less than the event horizon radius, it will collapse to form a supermassive black hole. And uh, if it is rotating, n is the quantum number of the angular momentum, we find that if the mass of the bosonic ultralight particle is 10 to the power minus 20 electron volt, indeed, you can form supermassive black hole having mass greater than billion times sun's mass. So uh, our theory assumes that um, uh, the dark matter is in the form of ultralight particles. And uh, so we are excitedly waiting to find out what is the nature of ultra uh, 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 nature of dark matter so far the other um, uh, theory of dark matter namely weakly interacting massive dark matter particle which are predicted from particle physics like supersymmetric theories etc they have not been seen in large hadronic uh, collider so far uh, so we don't know what the real nature of dark matter particles are. So if dark matter particles are instead ultralight axions, then we will be excited because uh, we would further on uh, sort of, we will uh, look at formation of supermassive black holes from such ultralight cold dark matter particles. This is my final slide as of now. This slide shows the large scale structure of our universe. Every dot is a galaxy in this picture. As you can see, when you look at the large scale structure of the universe, 
you see the galaxy is distributed in the form of shells there are voids region there are shells uh, filaments and so on and these are only bright aspect these are all coming from the stars and gas of the galaxy but filling them up is a mysterious dark matter and we don't know what the dark matter processes are going on and this is really an exciting time and i will uh, stop my lecture here i will rather uh, want to interact with you i will take up questions so please feel free to ask any questions thank you very much thank you sir for your nice presentation sir so uh, i think the student have learned a lot of things about the supermassive black holes and their formation so we have got some questions sir so if you allow we can uh, start the oh, yeah, discussion yeah. session sir yeah. I mean, as i tell all my okay, students so, uh, all, yeah. questions, all questions are important yeah. so there is no trivial question yeah, all yeah. questions so so the first question is what is the schwarzschild black hole uh, this question yeah. has uh, sent me in yeah. my inbox yeah first let us go back yeah yeah so first of all let me tell you about the uh short shy space time if you take any spherically symmetric star any spherically symmetric star so sun is all almost spherically symmetric so is earth earth is also almost uh, spherically symmetric any spherically symmetric object if you work out the einstein's equation in the region outside the matter distribution as schwarzschild did you will get this solution so this was the exact solution that schwarzschild obtained outside a spherically distributed system of uh, matter and it turns out that if you take such a spherically symmetric matter distribution and compress it if you compress it below a radius of 2 gm by c square entire matter necessarily will collapse to form a black hole by black hole i mean all matter collapses to a point so entire mass as predicted by classical general relativity goes to a point okay and therefore mass density is infinity the curvature radius is zero so therefore the curvature is infinity and the singularity and there is a mathematical surface around the singularity at a radius of 2 gm by c square this mathematical surface is called the event horizon and in fact no light can come out from within the event horizon so therefore you can't see what is going on in the event horizon inside the event horizon so an outsider outside observer if he sees a particle falling initially he will see the particle falling with an acceleration but as it comes closer to the event horizon because of the gravitational time dilation you can show from general relativity that in strong gravity clocks run slowly and it has been established from the gps uh, on board satellites going around earth that indeed in strong gravity clocks go slower and in particular for a black hole one can show that as clocks move towards the event horizon an outsider obse outside observer will see that the clock is ticking at a slower and slower rate and when it reach reaches the event horizon the observer will see that the clock is not uh ticking at all time has become frozen as it reaches the event horizon but this is what the external observer sees if you are falling with the clock you will of course fall with your clock in a finite time 
and reach the singularity. So there are these two different viewpoints. Uh, what is seen by an external observer, while what is seen by a freely falling observer. So this is the peculiar things that go around a uh, black hole. And a spherically symmetric black hole is called the Schwarzschild black hole. Thank you, sir, for your uh, answer, sir. We have got another question. This is not just pushing this is, uh, his request. Uh, kindly explain the dark energy and dark matter also in context of black yeah, hole. Sure, definitely. So let's go forward. All right. So uh, first of all, let's come to dark matter. Where do we get the idea that there is dark matter? The entire work on dark matter started with Vought, who was examining the uh, stellar motion in our galaxy. And he realized that the stars are going up and down the disk, and there seems to be more matter than what is seen using telescope. Similarly, Zwicky, he was looking at clusters of galaxies. There are a gravitational bound system having more than 1,000 galaxies in, the, in such a system. They are called clusters of galaxies. There are rich clusters of galaxies in catalog by Abel. They are called Abel clusters of galaxy. By monitoring the motion of the galaxies in this cluster, in particular the coma cluster, Zwicky, he showed that unless there is additional mass which is not seen through the telescope, the cluster can never remain bound because the galaxies are moving so fast in this cluster. Unless there is more matter to hold them gravitationally, the galaxies would just escape. But then why is the cluster still remaining as a bound system? So Zwicky postulated there must be hidden mass associated with the cluster of galaxies. Later on, Vera Rubin, uh, she, what she did was she measured for a spiral galaxy, the stars are bounded within the disk, but far away you can also have smaller neutral hydrogen cloud and neutral hydrogen cloud because of proton and electron in a hydrogen atom, when they flip, it emits a 21 centimeter radio line. And Vera Rubin and her collaborators, they measured the redshift of this 21 centimeter line coming from hydrogen. And thereby, they established the rotational speed of this neutral hydrogen cloud going around the spiral galaxies, they analyzed many, many spiral galaxies. And they found that standard Newtonian gravity would say that if I'm going far away from main stars making the galaxy, the rotational speed must fall down as square root of r because of the fact v square equal to square root of uh, v square equal to gm by r from centripetal acceleration argument. So as you go further away from the galaxy, entire matter of the galaxy, visible matter is here. But then when you go further away from a galaxy, the rotational speed must go down as 1 over square root of r. But instead, for many galaxies, the rotational speed is going up. For some, the rotational speed flattens out. There is a puzzle of flat rotational uh, velocity, so-called flat rotation curves. They can be explained only if you have matter which don't give out light but present and such that the total mass enclosed within a particular radius increases as you go outwards. Only then you can explain flat rotation curves. And that is the reason from these gravitational influence on baryonic matter, people inferred 
the existence of dark matter. And now we know that all galaxies, they are sort of, they are in the central region of a big cloud of dark matter. Similarly, clusters of galaxies are also, they are embedded inside huge dark matter halo. Existence of dark matter came from the gravitational influence they exert on stars, on gaseous uh, clouds, on galaxies in a cluster, and so on. On the other hand, dark energy, this dark energy, it came from, the evidence came from the expansion of the universe. It turned out that Schmidt, Rice, and Pearl Mutter, when they were observing the redshift of distant galaxies versus how far they are, they found instead of the relation that you normally would ha have for an expanding universe, the redshift and distance, luminosity distance of these galaxies show that the rate at which the universe is expanding, instead of decreasing with time, the rate of expansion is actually increasing with time. The so-called late time acceleration, the size of our universe is not only increasing like this or like this, but it is increasing in an accelerated fashion. Now, that is what is very surprising. For example, if I throw a cricket ball outwards, then the distance between me and the cricket ball, of course, will be increasing. But I know that the rate at which the speed is going down as the cricket ball is going up is negative because of the attractive gravitational force due to Earth. While the accelerating universe shows that gravity at such scales must be repulsive. How do you get repulsive gravity, which drives an accelerated expansion? Turns out that in general relativity, the gravity, net gravitational acceleration comes from a term which is energy density plus three times pressure. More is the energy density plus three times pressure, more is the gravitational acceleration. So, if you want to have repulsive gravity, you want energy density plus three times pressure to be negative. If energy density plus three times pressure is negative, then such a source will produce accelerating uh, uh, universe, that means it will produce repulsive gravity. And dark energy is postulated to be some kind of a weird matter for which energy density plus three times pressure is negative. Of course, we cannot produce any such matter in our laboratory. In our laboratory, all matter that has been produced satisfy positive pressure. So dark energy is a postulated entity with highly negative pressure so that energy density plus three times pressure is negative. Only such a weird matter can produce the observed accelerating universe. As you know, in 2012, Rise, Perlmutter and Schmidt, they were awarded Physics Nobel Prize for discovering this late acceleration of the universe. So in other words, dark matter always produces attractive gravity, while dark energy produces repulsive gravity. But we still don't know what exactly is the dark matter, and we are further away from truth as to the nature of the dark energy. Thank you, sir. 
so we have another question so is there any possibility of having density of supermassive black holes less than the density of water for example uh, less than the value of a thousand kg per meter cube yes it is possible uh, it's a very good question let me go to the black hole um, slide So let's ask, what is the density of a black hole? Supposing matter has fallen through, if you have compressed it below the short shell radius, you have compressed the matter and the matter has fallen into r equal to zero, there's a singularity. Of course, outside observer will never see the singularity because no event that is happening within the event horizon radius can escape outwards. So for an external observer, the matter occupies a size of event horizon. So the density of matter according to the external observer is mass divided by 4 pi Schwarzschild radius cube. That means mass divided by some constant into m cube. That means density of a black hole goes as 1 over m square because mass divided by 2 gm by c square whole cube is equal is proportional to 1 over m square. What does it tell you? That if m becomes larger, the density becomes smaller. Not the density of the singularity. Singularity density is always infinite. But an outside observer will never see the singularity. He, for him, the matter is hovering near the event horizon because he will never see anything collapsing past the event horizon because of the time dilation, gravitational time dilation I talked about. For an outside observer, the entire mass of the black hole is hovering near the event horizon um, radius. So for an outside observer, the density is mass divided by 4 pi Schwarzschild radius cube, which is proportional to 1 over m square. Note the inverse proportionality, 1 over m square. Then if the black hole mass is large, the density will be small. And we know of supermassive black holes. Supermassive black holes mass is more than million solar mass and most of the active galactic nuclei have supermassive black holes in excess of billion solar mass. So indeed, for a very large supermassive black hole, this density can be as much as water density or even smaller. So that's not a problem. Thank you, sir, for your answer, sir. We have another question. So how the study of black hole help us to understand the formation of life? Well, not directly. Uh, formation of life requires <coughs> some chemical processes in which amino acids can form. Similarly, you must have DNA and RNA to form because the existing life, all existing life that we know of, they are the RNA DNA which with the help of amino acids they cause metabolism and replication of cells <clears throat> and uh, we need regions where matter can come together in large density, matter meaning not just hydrogen and helium, but higher elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. Unless we have such systems like planets, comets, like for example, recently comets have been discovered with amino acids as well as, yeah, dipeptides. So far, no uh, 
other celestial object has been uh, seen with DNA or RNA, but comets have been discovered with amino acids. So far, only Earth seems to be uh, the planet where amino acids, DNA, RNA, and living systems have been discovered. But very of, often we see exoplanets around stars. So I'm sure in future exoplanets around other stars will be discovered, which will have amino acids and uh, DNA, RNA, and therefore in another maybe 50 years or less, people will discover exoplanets with extraterrestrial life present. And these are again exi exciting times for people who are doing research on exoplanets. But the formation of exoplanets directly are not dependent on uh, formation of black holes. Formation of black holes are directly uh, related to evolution of uh, stars. It is the end product of very massive stars that lead to black hole formation. And evolution of the star also leads to production of higher elements. Particularly, it is the explosion of stars whose central core can become neutron star or black hole, but the explosion of the outer envelope, they scatter heavier elements like carbon, silicon, oxygen, gold, nitrogen, which finally form uh, living systems. So both black hole as well as living system are part of the stellar evolution. So in a sense, you can say black holes and human beings, they are actually cousin brothers. They all emerge out of the evolution of the stars. Thank you, sir. The, there is another question. This may be the last question. So is it possible to create a mini black hole in laboratory? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, this is a favorite question for me. And also if Professor Jain Islam would have been there today, he would have also liked it because he also has worked on primordial black holes. I also did some work on baryogenesis from very small black holes, mass being of the order of few kilograms. Such primordial black holes have not been seen in laboratory. Now, uh, you might recollect that there were some theories uh, led uh, by um, Professor Dimopoulos and uh, his collaborators about uh, extra large spatial dimension. And in extra large spatial dimension, you can have uh, a the main gravitational constant, the fundamental gravitational constant may be larger. While in their theory, uh, the Dwali, uh, Professor Dwali, Professor Dimapolos, and uh, many others, uh, in their theory, because of the presence of extra large dimension, in our existing 3 plus 1 dimension, gravity is spreading out in all dimension. Therefore, in our three space dimension, gravity gets weakened. And the Newtonian gravitational constant that we measure is smaller. According to their theory, the actual gravitational constant is much larger. And therefore, the corresponding Schwarzschild radius in higher dimensional uh, extra large dimensional space time will be larger. And according to their theory, uh, you could produce any black holes by high energy collision of TV energy scale protons in large hadronic collider. In fact, one of the motivation for large hadronic collider was to look for such TV scale uh, black holes produced because of the higher strength of the gravitational constant. But so far, such black holes have not been produced in the Large Hadronic Collider. If they were seen, then certainly 
uh, Dwali, Dimopoulos, they would have been awarded Nobel Prize. Uh, but anyway, these are exciting times, hopefully, with upgraded large hadronic collider or even accelerators in the future, which can accelerate protons to much higher energy, let's say 10, 100 times tera electron volt, 100 TeV or more. And if you see uh, black holes being produced in such colliders because of extra large spatial dimension, those would be exciting times. Then uh, it'll be unfortunate that Hawking uh, is no more with us because such extra large uh, space dimension uh, theory is predicting uh, production of uh, very tiny black holes which evaporate due to Hawking radiation that would have corroborated, provided of course one would see that Hawking radiation, it would corroborate Hawking's 1974 uh, work on uh, Hawking evaporation of tiny black holes. Thank you, sir, for your uh, nice presentation and discussion session, sir. We should conclude our discussion session as there is no more question. So we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pablo University of Science and Technology. So most you, have, yeah, you have accepted our invitation, sir, uh, in this corona pandemic situation, though you are too busy with your work so for our students. So we are very grateful to you, sir. And uh, in near future, we will arrange another webinar if you have a time for our students, sir. And after the pandemic, I will invite you uh, in my in university for a face-to-face uh, -face session, sir. So oh, definitely. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So, so uh, bye, sir. Well, uh, thanks uh, that uh, you presented this platform uh, yeah. to discuss with uh, you as well as young students. Uh, regarding the exciting developments that is happening. And I'm sure um, in future, more exciting uh, discoveries would be made. It's a great thing for all you youngsters. So those who are interested, study um, mathematics and physics by solving many, many problems. And all the best to all my Thank you, sir, for your uh, nice comments, sir. The main aim of our today's uh, this international physics webinar is to motivate our students in this corona pandemic situation, sir. So we know that uh, our students uh, have to go back their uh, home place uh, as the, all, all the institutions have been yeah. shut down. So they may be frustrated uh, by staying their home. So we actually uh, uh, try uh, our best to uh, encourage them and. Uh, uh, by by uh, by bringing some uh, famous physicists like you to motivate them and encourage them and I I, I hope uh, some of our students may be motivated uh, in, in and maybe in near future they will in, feel interested in uh, basic physics studies uh, and research and uh, if it will happen then uh, our work will be success so thanks again sir you're welcome okay. bye for today sir and hopefully we will we'll, 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 uh, we'll arrange another webinar with you in the near future, sir. So, bye. Sure, sure. Bye, bye. All the best.